Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Pastor Jeff here again from my, my backyard. Um, not sure. I hope you can't hear all the noise in the background. It's, it's peaceful to me, but I can hear my pool pump and the birds and the wind chimes and a little bit of traffic. Uh, so, um, uh, in all honesty, as an extrovert, I'm feeling a bit of the, the strain of confinement, but uh, this doing this devotional is... Uh, is a great joy. It gives me, and thank you so much for your feedback. It gives me uh, great encouragement to continue doing this, um, and not just for my, for your benefit, you know, but but for my own. So, thank you. I'm gonna just give you some thoughts here at the very end of uh, Galatians two. I don't have time to teach all our way through it, but you know, Paul has gone to Jerusalem and and faced those who've opposed him and done it the right way, which is to go face to face and not sweep things under the rug and to foster unity and and love by addressing concerns. And that then affords him the opportunity to talk openly with the Galatians about what he'd done because it it had been talked about already. So it wasn't gossip. Um, And again, he just says just a few verses here. I, I would call this, you know, a tattoo verse. It's the kind of verse you see tattooed on somebody's body. It's so significant. And the end of Galatians chapter 2, uh, let's see, verse 19, 20, 21, Paul says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Man, this is just a, a power-packed uh uh, passage and like I said that verse 20 for I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me is you know I, I, I bet you that's the sort of thing you see on on, on uh, that's the, the vision verse for a ministry or, or, or like I said tattooed on somebody's body but what, what's Paul getting at here it, notice that Paul doesn't say that the law has died uh, the law reflects in its entirety the, the holy heart and the character and the nature of God. The law is beautiful. Um, there's nothing wrong with the law. It wasn't the law that died, but Paul saying that he died to the law. Well, how did he die to the law? Because, you know, James might have said, well, Paul, you look alive to me. Uh, what do you mean you're, you're dead to the law and you've been crucified? Well, what Paul is saying is that it's the law that killed him. He's saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, that that the law showed him that as he studied the law, that he could, he, that this fr- frustration in, within him was the realization that he could never fully live up to his holy standard. And for a long time before Paul even knew Jesus, I'm sure he thought as he studied that if he could just perfectly keep the law, that God would accept him on the basis of his law keeping. But he comes to the point where he really understands it, really gets it, in the way that Jesus explained it in the Sermon on the Mount. And Paul realizes that the law actually makes him guilty before God. It doesn't, the law doesn't justify him because, uh, you know, he, if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking all the laws. And so this sense of guilt before God actually kills Paul and makes him see that keeping the law isn't the answer. And so Paul realizes that on the cross, this, this, this great exchange occurs, that Jesus goes uh, to the cross and and, and, and gives this old try to be right before God by the law life uh, idea and, and crucifies it on the cross. And so Jesus gives Paul his life, the, his righteous life, the, the kind of life that, that he offers to all of us. And Paul says that Christ came to live in him. And so Paul's life wasn't his own anymore. He's saying it's not mine. It belongs to Jesus. Paul didn't simply own his own life, that, that the life that died, he, he, he's now just become a steward of the life, this new life that Jesus has given him. He says he won't take that for granted. He won't, you know, exercise, he won't be vain with the, the grace that God's given him. I love how he says this, that he's, he's been crucified with Christ. Um, I, he says it a different way in 2 Corinthians 5. Some theologians call it the great exchange, and it's my favorite way to think about this. In that passage, Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin who know, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Just There is no better deal that's ever been offered humankind than this. If you're a business person, look, this is the best deal offered. This is taking something that's worth nothing 
and exchanging it for something of immeasurable value. Taking something that's like a filthy rag and saying, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a king's fortune for this. Uh, the prophets say that all of our righteous acts are just filthy rags before God. And what Paul is saying here is, is that here's the deal Jesus offers. And this is what he's aiming at in Galatians 2. He says, I bring all of my sin to the cross and I let that be crucified on the cross with Christ. And in exchange for my sin, Jesus will actually pour un- into me all of his righteousness. His righteousness for my sin. Man, what an exchange. And beloved, if you know that, you know the most freeing. There is nothing that brings you greater freedom than the idea that God would pour all of his heavenly treasure into our sinful selves. And so I hope that he has changed your identity. I hope that you have died to self, that you've been crucified with Christ, and that you have, in fact, exchanged your sinful life for his righteous life. Let that be so. And so, Jesus, we pray. We thank you for this this great exchange. We thank you that we can say, like Paul, if we follow you, that we have been crucified with you and that we no longer live, but it's you, Jesus, that lives within us. And for those who are my... My dear friends who might be listening who don't know you, I pray, Lord, that you would draw everyone uh, in this season where we're confined to home closer to your heart, Lord, and you might bring many to know you um, for the first time in a long time or for the first time ever. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Maranatha.